Well, welcome everyone from wherever you're listening, and especially I'd love to extend a welcome to our new class members. We're excited to have you join us for this year, even though the start of the year has been unusual for those of you coming in person. There's no way we could have seen what was coming for our first few weeks of the year, but as we've studied prophecy this week, I found real life application and the comfort of knowing God has his plans and his reasons, and he can be trusted with these curveballs of life. And so thank you for being super flexible. We will stick with the current plan to be on Zoom for the next few weeks. The preschool and student program classes won't meet until we are back in the building, but we do have plans for the leaders to be sending a video teaching out. So have your kids be watching for that each week, and we'll also let you know a definite date for returning to the building when we have it. Were you able to find the recorded lecture on mybsf.org last week? If not, here's the key. Typically by Friday, BSF advances the mybsf.org to the next lesson. What this means is you'll need to click on the back arrow in the upper left corner of the lessons page to locate the lecture. I think there's a slide here to show you how. If you try this and still don't see the lecture, please verify with your group leader that you're using the email address that we have on file for you. And did you know that BSF has an app? You can just log into it by using your mybsf.org credentials. And when you use the app, you'll be able to access your lesson answers, listen to the audio lesson notes, listen to watch or download the lecture audio or video. All right, well, speaking of lecture, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then dive into this week's lesson. Father God, would you help us to set aside the distractions that are going on in our lives and hear what it is that you have to speak to our hearts as we dive into the mystery of your prophetic word. Um, Father, we just welcome your Holy Spirit to be here among us. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Well, in August, my family and I spent a day in San Francisco. The weather was what you would expect. I think they call it naturally air-conditioned there, and it was a dreary and foggy day most of the day. Of course, we had to cross the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Everyone does that when you're touring the Bay Area. We'd seen the bridge from a distance during the day, barely. The, fog, the foggy clouds hovered and hung thicker to completely hide the top of the towers that hold up the cables. It was late afternoon when we drove across it, and then the oddest thing happened. We pulled off into the visitor center to take some pictures, and I noticed it was completely sunny. I looked back across the bay to the dingy city, just as the foggy clouds were literally lifting before my eyes. In a matter of moments, I could see the whole bridge and the city of San Francisco off in the distance. When the Golden Gate bridge was completed in 1937, it was the tallest and longest suspension bridge in the world and came to be recognized as a symbol of the power and progress of the United States around the world. I wonder if the first few people to walk on it or drive a car or semi over it were a bit nervous. Would the road hold up or the cable snap? It's terrifying to think a bridge might give way and send you careening down to the water below ending in your probable demise. That's why we want capable men and women meticulously designing, precisely engineering, and heroically constructing our bridges. We want to be safe. We want a bridge to provide reliability and security so that we can trust it. So it is with living a life of faith. Not only do we want something, we need something that we can wholeheartedly trust in. As a Christian, we're called to put our faith in a God we cannot see, to walk by faith and not by sight. That's easier said than done, right? Well, God doesn't just throw those words out in the air and pretend we can make sense of them and then just do faith. No, he gives us everything we need to have faith and keep it. One essential way he provides what we need is through prophecy. Prophecy is a gift to us from God. It's like a solid bridge that supports, 
holds up and anchors us to be able to walk our faith out with security and confidence. His prophecy bridge has support beams that drive deep down into the soil in the ground and brace our faith and bear the weight and stress. It has strong towers with cables that will need to hold us up when it's hard to believe. And his bridge is securely anchored at the beginning and end that support the entire load of our faith and keep us from sliding when we're being pulled by the culture and the lies all around us and from within us. And so the main thing you can know today is that biblical prophecy undergirds our trust in God and his plans. Biblical prophecy undergirds our trust in God and his plans. We're going to look at this truth in two divisions. My first division is God's prophecy, the infrastructure. And my second division is God's prophecy, the roadway. So that's God's prophecy, the infrastructure, and God's prophecy, the roadway. Well, last week we had a broad overview of the Bible and learned it's one big story that begins and ends with God, and it's all about Jesus. I hope you took to heart that right now God's pursuing you with his perfect love. When you put your trust in Jesus as your perfect husband, he makes you ready and beautiful with a gown of righteousness while you await the final and full consummation as his bride. Next week, to get some context before we dive in verse by verse, we're going to take a broad look at the whole book of Revelation, which tells us about what's coming, the destiny of humanity, and God's glorious kingdom that awaits believers. Before we do that, it's helpful to understand that what lies ahead for us is firmly rooted in the past. What God's done, what he's declared, and what he's promised. And so that's why we're going to talk about biblical prophecy today. So using our bridge analogy, in this first division, we're going to look at the framework or the infrastructure of prophecy through three different necessary elements that make up a secure bridge. First, we'll see the support beams, what it is and where it's from. This grounds our faith and braces our beliefs. Then we'll look at the towers and cables, the character of it that holds us up when we struggle to believe. And then we'll also see the anchors on each end, Jesus Christ, who keeps the whole bridge and us from sliding when everything wants to shift us every which way. So first, the support beams that ground the bridge of prophecy. What is prophecy? The Greek word for prophecy is apocalypse, which means an unveiling, a disclosure, or it can mean a proclamation of the truth. Truth that was once veiled or hidden is now revealed. Since biblical prophecy is all about God, it's God making himself known. He's increasingly revealing more of himself. Prophecy is also a message of God's truth spoken in power. A prophet is someone chosen by God to be his messenger, to declare what God said with power because the Holy Spirit is right there in what the prophet says. Prophecy can fall into two categories. Foretelling is a prediction about the future. It's a message from God that has authority over people and events. The message could be for people at the moment or for people in the distant future or even on into end times. These types of prophecies have what's called a mountain peaks perspective. If you look at a distant mountain range, you see it as one piece. It's not until you go up into a helicopter and look down on the peaks that you see the valley in between them. From eye level, it's as if two events are superimposed on the peaks, happening at the same time. But there's actually a valley in between them, creating space and time. 
This is also the already and not yet aspect of foretold prophecy. It often had meaning for both at the same time. The message could be a warning of judgment for those who reject the message of God, or it could be one of hope and perspective to encourage God's people to endure faithfulness regardless of their circumstances. It's important to understand that right now, you and I are living in the valley between biblical peaks. Looking back at the prophecies foretold that actually happened are a support beam for our faith. As we study Revelation, what a gift God's given us to take a peek at the final peaks of history as we know it. He didn't have to do that for us. The second category of prophecy is forth telling, F-O-R-T-H, forth telling. It's a message about the present. These are general declarations of what God's word says. They challenge his people to live lives of faith and holiness. So sermons, teachings, and discipleship are examples, and they're most effective and powerful when the Holy Spirit's power is at work. Well, where does biblical prophecy come from? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 starts with the words, All scripture is God-breathed. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 21 says that we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it. Above all, you must understand no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, God is the author of the Bible, so God's the only true source of every prophetic passage. We see here prophecies are both God-breathed and God-proclaimed by his chosen prophets. Back when God was inspiring the prophets and authors, he breathed out his very words into them. Men weren't just writing down thoughts that came to them. If that were the case, we could easily dismiss the Bible because it would have been written by just some guys a really long time ago. But no, God was doing CPR. He was breathing his life-filled words into them so that they could breathe them out with pen and paper. God was like a canister of oxygen, creating life in and through his words and prophecies. Just as we can't live life without breathing oxygen, we can't trust any words of prophecy that don't have life because they haven't been breathed by the breath of God. Now let's look at the tall towers that connect the cables, the character that holds the bridge up. So who is this God, the originator of prophecy? Well, the prophet Isaiah wrote in chapters 45 and 46, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none but me. God is all-knowing. He's sovereign over all, with no beginning and no end. He's a triune God, one God, yet three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's self-existent, self-sustaining, and self-sufficient. He's true, trustworthy, and faithful. He's the exalted one. He's above all, yet he's personal. God's prophecy shows he's merciful. When the Israelites were facing discipline and about to be exiled with no hope, he breathed these words of hope into his prophet Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. 
God is the ultimate prophet, holding both prophecy and its fulfillment in himself. Since only God can accurately reveal the future because man is flawed, he's both loving and gracious to tell an undeserving people what's coming, both as a warning to the disobedient and to give hope to those who are his. We can have hope because the utter faithfulness of God is revealed through biblical prophecy. Only God is 100% exact and 100% faithful. History is full of his abundant record of faithfulness in the past. And here are just three um, evidences of those from the Old Testament. In Genesis 15, the Lord told Abraham that for certain, for 400 years, his descendants would be slaves in a far country and that he'd punish the nation that put them in slavery. In the Old Testament, prophet after prophet predicted the Israelite exile, and then they predicted the return to Jerusalem after 70 years. This and so much more happened just as predicted. And then 600 years before the events of Pentecost, the prophet Joel declared God would pour out his spirit on his people. The apostle Peter quoted Joel to explain what was happening at the birth of the church after Jesus ascended to heaven in the New Testament, and there's still a future fulfillment of this yet to come. Specific prophecy didn't cause these events to happen, but rather they stood and still stand as a witness until the prophecy either was fulfilled or is yet to be fulfilled. God's perfect record of fulfilling prophecy gives us confidence to trust him completely. The last but certainly not the least important part of the infrastructure for our bridge of prophecy are the anchors on each end of the bridge. What or shall I say who, keeps the whole bridge and us from sliding when everything wants to shift us every which way. Well, the book of Revelation is prophetic, and it opens with the answer. Let's read chapter 1 of Revelation, verses 1 to 2. It says, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, anchoring prophecy on each end of the bridge with security. God's anchored purpose is to reveal Jesus and inspire our faith in him. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ stands central to all of God's prophecy. After the fall of humanity in Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 6, God promised a redeemer who would crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3, 15. This prophecy came to pass when Jesus came as a baby in the manger and then in his ultimate actions of his death and resurrection. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, the prophet Moses declared God would raise up a greater one like himself among the Israelites. This prophecy was fulfilled by a long list of biblical prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Amos, and Jonah but it was ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, the greatest prophet of all. Many prophets spoke and wrote about the coming Messiah and Savior, the prophetic foretelling of Messiah's birth in Isaiah 7:14, his birthplace in Micah 5:2, his nature that he'd be fully God and fully man, Isaiah 11, 1 through 5 and of course his death and resurrection in Isaiah 53, one through 12. More than 20 Old Testament predictions were fulfilled within one 24 hour period at the time of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I mentioned last week through Abraham, God set apart a people for himself, yet his plan was to reach all the peoples of the earth with the gospel of his son, Jesus. Did you know the reason God revealed Jesus through prophecy was fulfilled the day you were saved? And this, this prophecy continues to be fulfilled every time someone accepts the invitation of Romans 10, 9, which says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here we can find our first principle of hope. Biblical prophecies reveal God's heart for his people. Biblical prophecies reveal God's heart for his people. The connecting theme in all of God's prophecies is his desire and promise to save his people. It's Jesus who stands at the center, the completion and perfection of these promises. God never wanted broken relationship with anyone, but when the events of Genesis chapter three revealed our sinful and rebellious hearts, the bridge between God and man broke into pieces and we plunged into the dark waters below. Yet instead of leaving us to drown, God in his mercy sent lifesavers in the form of prophets to warn soggy souls drowning in the waywardness of themselves, and he called them back to him. God is merciful, not treating you and I as we deserve. Instead, as you believe the gospel is personally for you and take it into your heart and life, Jesus declares you righteous and a full heir to all the riches of himself and his glorious kingdom. So just as the Golden Gate Bridge stood as a symbol of power and progress to the world, in the greatest of all senses, God's bridge of biblical prophecy stands as the power and progress for the world. It's not just a symbol, it's the foundation and is what propels us to progress to the culmination of all history. So how does the bridge of biblical prophecy undergird your grasp of God's heart and embolden you to walk by faith? What truth can you take away that will hold you up when doubts creep in, when the waters below are looming and it's hard to believe God's promises to you? And how can the truth that our God will always do what he says he will do anchor you in the midst of stormy life challenges? Well, Hebrews 7 verses 18 to 19 tell us that it's impossible for God to lie and to be encouraged that hope in Jesus is an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. So let's trust Jesus the reason for prophecy, and that he will anchor us. Well, ladies, let's turn to our second division and look at prophecy's roadway. The purpose of a bridge is to have a road so that people and cargo can go back and forth over water or deep valleys. It's the same for the bridge of prophecy, so we can look back and forth at what God said and who he is, all to know him better, as we're driving back and forth over those waters and deep valleys. Picture with me a bridge between two land masses. In Revelation, we'll see prophecy as a bridge connecting the Old with the New Testament. It's a roadway connecting his first coming when he came as a savior for anyone who would believe and his second coming still in the future when he'll come as judge to the world and husband and king to gather his own to live with him forever. 
Prophecy is a two-way street. Jesus came to us, and we are going back to him. It's the roadway between two peaks. And as our eyes look to the future of Christ's return and the culmination of history through the truth of what God has declared, we'll use the past to understand and base our hope on for the future. As we drive along the prophecy roadway, God warns us there will be false prophets, attacks on the bridge, and we need to guard against their overt and their subtle deceit. The character of a prophet is a great test of true prophecy. In biblical days, true prophets were Israelites. Their message was given in the name of the Lord, and they were able to predict events both near and far in the future, and they had fulfillment dates with them. Their words agreed with previous or future predictions because God is the centerpiece of all true prophets. Their words have and will be confirmed by history. False prophets were non-Israelites proclaiming half-truths, their own words mixed up with the word of God. And often they had a message of peace when disaster was actually on its way. Wisdom calls us to be on high alert today. The greatest test of prophecy is if what someone says actually comes true. History, a prediction coming to perfect fulfillment, says it all. We can expect 100% accuracy in the things of God. God's not the author of confusion, so test the spirits and beware of false prophets whose eyes are on themselves instead of Jesus. What God says is more important than what you or I or any other flawed human being says. So go back to the word and test every person's words. When, when God tells us he's going to do something, he'll actually do it. So this has been a lot of talk about prophecy. And what does it mean for you? When we don't believe in the truth and power of biblical prophecy, we fail to recognize God's sovereign hand and purpose, purposeful plan for human history, for our life and for eternity. It reveals our desire to control our own destiny. We work really hard to make happen what we want. And if we achieve it, well, we become our own God. When life's stormy and foggy and our plans go awry, we spiral into all kinds of darkness, including hopelessness, and we look to our own next best plan to fix things. We don't heed God's warnings. We don't admit sin will be judged, nor do we truly see how we live our life really does matter. However, when we do believe God's bridge of prophecy stands strong and definitive, God's presence and purposes provide a stable foundation for us to drive through life on. We welcome it to change us and give us God-centered confidence to face our circumstances, trusting the character of God when we don't much like what's going on. We allow prophecy to prepare us for what's around the corner and what's coming years from now. All that we can't fully understand or explain, we leave firmly in God's grip. We rest confidently as the waves crash against us, against our families, our health, or our finances, knowing our God, who controls the future, cannot be undone by anything. His plan is immovable, and he will prevail. And that leads us to our second principle of, of hope. Biblical prophecy prepares God's people to live by faith in Jesus Christ. Biblical prophecy prepares God's people to live by faith in Jesus Christ. As I spent the day in the fog and gloom of San Francisco, I didn't know what was going to happen when I drove over the bridge or when I got to the other side of it. 
As we drive on the roadways of Revelation's Prophecy Bridge this year, there's going to be some heavy fog and cloudy days, and you won't be sure what's ahead. You'll hear me quote this phrase often, all scripture is equally true, but not equally clear. This statement has helped me so much. We're not going to figure it all out. But I can guarantee you, some clouds are going to lift, and the fog's going to clear a bit, and we're going to have incredible moments where the glorious light of sunshine, God's S-O-N, is going to shine forth, and Jesus is going to be, re be revealed in a way you've never seen him before. He wants you to know him deeper still, so he can bless you in deeper ways, so you can walk this roadway of life facing today and tomorrow with steady confidence in him. God's the meticulous designer, the precise engineer, and our hero who constructed the indestructible bridge of prophecy that will stand the eternal test of time. He's also the one who's constructed and is guiding the roadway of your life that's also like a bridge. Some days it looks stable and flawless, but then the Mack truck of life hits. All the pressures and the unknowns start driving on your bridge, and suddenly your cracks and potholes are exposed. Or the barge of the enemy slams into you like the barge in Baltimore did last spring. We've all had days and seasons when we feel the bridge is going to give way and we're sure we're going to careen into the dark waters below. To be human is to fear and despair. But in Christ, you have to know you and your bridge are safe and secure. God can be trusted. In whatever has happened in your life in the past, or is happening today, or is coming tomorrow, it must somehow be part of God's plan. Sure, you may feel a jolt, but the cracks and the sways in your bridge are secure and the barges cannot destroy you. You're grounded in, held up, and anchored in the sovereign love, wisdom, and plan of our great God who rules and reigns regardless of the crashing waves around you. You are safe in Jesus. The words of prophecy say Jesus is returning. And one day, while you're driving on the roadway, Jesus is going to come for you. And he's going to drive you, or maybe he'll fly you, to experience the greatest fulfillment of the bridge of prophecy. And just like I saw the fog rise before my very eyes to see the city of San Francisco, we're going to see the new city prophesied in Revelation across the sea of glass. And the hope and faith we have right now in the promise of fulfilled prophecy, well, we won't need that anymore because our faith will become sight and we will live in the safety and security of the arms of our Savior, Redeemer, and King Jesus forever. Although your future may seem uncertain, how will you trust Jesus who knows with certainty what lies ahead. He who promises to drive you safely to the other side, he is faithful. Would you pray with me? God, would you help us to trust your word and who you are and take it to heart to truly change our lives so we can stand firmly on you. And it's in your hope-filled name that I pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me, ladies, and have a wonderful week. We will see you next time in Revelation. Take care.